Hey, thanks everybody for being here. My name is Rob Massey. I'm a tax partner at Deloitte. I had the privilege seven years ago of starting what we now have today as our blockchain practice, which has evolved a lot from when we started in this space. Um, we do serve throughout the ecosystem, um, a lot of tokenized business models, a lot of investors, and a lot of infrastructure, which today is our topic, which is about as digital assets are proliferating, how does enterprise engage, and what types of infrastructure projects, what kind of solid companies are out there, I'm privileged to have Nathan from Anchorage today to really bring that to light as we bring a lot of lenses to the industry, hopefully bring some insights to you all. Go through some introductions, Michael. Hi, my name is Mike Marzelli. I'm a uh, senior manager in our audit practice in San Francisco, um, focusing on blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and uh, the audit methodologies that we're developing and the accounting for digital assets. By background, um, I've really worked in financial services, um, global uh, trading of, of uh, traditional assets, so uh, transi transitioned really well into digital assets. Hey there, I'm Nathan McCauley. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Anchorage. We are a crypto custodian. Uh, that serves uh, institutional investors. Great, my name is Brian Hansen. I'm an audit partner here in San Francisco. Uh, I like Mike, uh, my entire career was in banking and brokerage and FinTech, uh, but spending a lot of my time within blockchain and the digital asset world. I lead our uh, digital asset strategy and blockchain strategy for the firm for audit practice. And I'm Tim Davis. Uh, I'm, I have a role in the firm where I lead what we call our global center of excellence for blockchain assurance. So that's coordinating what we do around the world in terms of client acceptance, methods, tools and technologies, and just creating a community uh, around this capability worldwide. Thank you. We can transition to the slides. Awesome. So as we, as we spoke about, we're all coming about this from different angles. Ah, that is not. We're coming at this from different angles um, as we watch uh, digital assets proliferate, right? Which is which is a word that we're using now. We've we've moved beyond those which are just a store of value, beyond those which have utility. And now we're talking about things, and, and you'll hear statements uh, in the media, you hear people make statements about stable coins, and oh, it's a security token. Important for us to, to recognize that as this industry evolves, that not all digital assets are created equal. In fact, they mean different things to different stakeholders. As an example, you'll hear the, the you'll hear council, you'll hear the SEC talk about, you know, security tokens, which which is fine. That is sort of one lens, very different lens when you when you put it into the bucket of something like tax, right? Not all stable coin is created equal. You see some stable coins which are which are literally digital representations of fiat currency. You see others that are backed generally by a basket of something or a right to redeem or a digital physical, a digital representation of a physical asset, making it easy for people to move diamonds or gold by virtue of, of, uh, of code versus physical movement of a digital asset. Um, we've seen utility tokens take on new meaning, gaining access to protocols or real-time rev splits, as we've seen it happen. Um, and and in, even in the securities token world, you'll see people have, um, have tokens as representation of a, of a right to a stream of income, could be a debt instrument, right, or could be deemed equity. All of those things have different meaning, different lenses, making sure that we, we sort of ground out on that. So as we move forward, it's just important to keep all this in mind. Um, it's a, you know, we're enabling new commerce, it's changing every day, and the role of, of, of the investor is changing, and the infrastructure it takes to support the, the, this um, evolution in digital assets is significant, right? And there's a lot of players. The one we're gonna highlight today is, is custody and how that enables enterprise to really engage as new commerce comes to life. That's, that's really a lot of the goal. Um, comments, I mean, Nathan, you were, you, you've been in this a while. And by the way, I like your Halloween costume. This oh, is thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're planning it. So, so tell me, um, so as, as you know, you've been in this space a while, as in terms of you know, custody, as you think about types of digital assets as they're proliferating. Sure, so there's uh, kind of walking, walking around a blockchain week, you see uh, the history of Bitcoin kind of slide going through, and that's where really everything started. And, and in a lot, of, a lot of ways, Bitcoin is uh, one, of the, one of the more kind of pro proliferated assets that we have right now. Uh, but what we're seeing is a, a huge number of additional use cases get built off of that 
uh, kind of initial innovation that came with Bitcoin. Uh, and so anything from uh, stable coins like Rob was talking about, there's different kinds there, uh, to uh, uh, Bitcoin and uh, other things like uh, Ethereum and other uh, kind of smart contract networks where you're seeing a, a, a goal of building kind of a world computer uh, based on all those. Uh, all of these different use cases uh, end up reducing to one common needed piece of infrastructure. And that common needed piece of infrastructure is key management and custody. Uh, and so there's, there's kind of two parts to that story. First, first part of it is, uh, at a technical level, many of these assets are, are bearer assets. Uh, and so the security of how they're held is incredibly important. Uh, and then on the other side, um, you have the whole regulatory environment. And you would like to hold these um, assets in a, a qualified custodian, in a, a custodian that is uh, regulated by uh, some sort of either a federal or state regulator. Uh, and so what we're seeing uh, within the marketplace is that uh, folks want to participate in the, in the crypto ecosystem. They want to be buying a, a variety of different assets and holding them and using them to uh, enable their businesses. Uh, while at the same time, they're kind of wanting that same level of trust and safety that they have uh, come to expect uh, from uh, institutional custody players. Um, so the, the way we look at that problem is kind of those, both of those sides take deep, deep technical investment. Uh, on, the, on the technology and infrastructure side, uh, being able to hold assets flexibly so that you can use them in the networks, uh, so that you can do everything that blockchain promises in terms of fast access to funds, participating in governance, staking, all these other kinds of uh, active uses of the assets uh, is, requires a, a deep technical investment. On, on the same side, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the regulatory frameworks, a lot of the um, expectations that regulators have here uh, within this asset are net new and also take, take a deep technical investment. Uh, and so we at Anchorage have decided to kind of do both things simultaneously. Uh, deeply, deeply invest in technology and deeply invest in uh, regulatory clarity and spending a lot of time with uh, regulators, auditors, uh, and uh, in many cases, legislators to um, really try to push this whole space forward. Awesome. So, so, so how has that changed, right? Have it, so, so the role of a custodian Right? How has that changed the way that we, as auditors, right, on occasion, how has that changed the way we're able to engage in the industry? Do you want to comment on that? And again, we've got lots of different assets going on, lots of different players involved. Do you want to comment, Brian? Yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe just to give you a sense of, of the audit world and kind of how this all ties together. So it, when I think about this, there's clearly a lot that's happened and a lot of dynamic change that's, that's transpiring right now within this world. And one of the things that we have to deal with um, is all the, basically the fact that there's not a lot of rules and regulations and clear, you know, accounting guidance as, as an example, uh, clear gap guidance that's right on point to a lot of what we're talking about here. So I think we all spent a lot of time making sure that you really think through at the very early onset what are the different things that you're getting into and how is that going to impact your internal control environment? What different kind of accounting issues are going to come up as a result of it? What do your regulators think about this? And I'll just echo the sentiment here. I think the really important part is transparency and regular dialogue with all these different constituents. I think we've seen that you really got to get in, do a really clear risk assessment of what's going on, what, what's the different environment look like within these. And you know, custody is such an important part to all this because if you think about the ecosystem, you know, a lot of those risks tie back to what a custodian does. And you really need to think through all the controls. So maybe Mike, you could probably add a little bit more to that. Yeah, as we're, as we're thinking about uh, audit methodology and different assurance formats that we're trying to use, it, it is underpinned by, the, uh, by custody and by the uh, existence and your rights to those assets. Um, so when we have a lot of these discussions, we can go only get so far, but we need, um, we need to be able to ensure that we can ensure the existence, rights, and obligations associated with those assets, and that, that kind of leads back to the custodian. Yeah. You're under I, a lot of pressure, Nathan, right? Yeah. You got auditors, <laughs> you got regulators. <laughs> auditors, regulators, and um, what's, what kind of after you get over that initial hump, of, okay, this is, this is really complex, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, what has been pretty impressive to see, both on the, on the audit side and on the regulatory side, is that after you solve all the problems, you actually end up in a better place than you have with traditional assets. Uh, because of the fact that blockchain networks 
are typically uh, public facing where the, the ledger is kind of available to everyone, you're actually able to get to a higher level of confidence than what you see in many traditional asset classes, uh, where in, in many traditional asset classes you have to take kind of a sampling approach where you say, okay, I'm gonna look, does the, does the client have, does this asset exist, does this asset exist, kind of statistically look at things and say, okay, yes, the, there's, we have high confidence that uh, their books and records are complete. Uh, in blockchain, you don't actually have to do that. You can fully audit all of the assets that a custodian has. You can fully also, um, audit all of the assets that any particular client has with that custodian uh, and get to really uh, down to the, uh, the cent or the satoshi level of confidence on uh, uh, everything that the uh, custodian is holding. Yeah, and that's really important for our side. I, I mean, that it's an exciting, but it's also, um, you know, there, there's different risks in the digital asset space. You know, if you send assets to the wrong place, you can't get them back. Mm -hmm. In a traditional world, there's ways to go back and reclaim those assets. So you have incremental risk, but you also have these new controls that are being built that address those risks, which is uh, really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've been on this controls journey a long time, Tim. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I would say, I mean, just a couple of sort of takeaways from this is I think as the industry emerges, it's actually getting more complex, not less complex, right? And so it's not to say in some of these spaces, as we said, that there is definitely a, a gap in terms of the guidance, but that doesn't say that just any old sort of reasonable best effort is going to be good enough because there are comparable analogies be that tax, be it accounting, be it controls, that you have to go back to to say, here's why we think what we're doing is sufficient in terms of addressing the risks. So my advice is, as you're getting into this space, you really want to discern what are your key core competencies. And the core competencies around other things that you don't have to be expert in, like custody, like some of these domains of auditing, regulatory compliance, controls, you absolutely want to find others that you can kind of lean on in terms of what's needed there and obviously you know we're in the business of helping businesses scale and work through those and we address and I think a number of those domains custody you know folks like Anchorage address that but um, I mean just a couple of sort of observations particularly in the custody space of how much we've seen that space move so as you're thinking about where you go for custody certainly not all custody providers are the same there are significant sort of differences in leading practice versus what a lot of providers do. And it goes to things like the types of assets that they might accept, right? How carefully they scrutinize the risks associated with each asset. And it might be called a digital asset framework, but every custodian in exchange should have this, which is their criteria for types of assets that they will accept. Because that's both for you, the customer's protection, as well as their protection. If some of these are just too shaky or too lacking in transparency, you ought, you ought to be not, not touching them. There's, there's that. And then there's all the leading practices on what does custody actually represent and things like how you make sure that um, keys are held securely, like in a FIPS-compliant HSM, uh, what sort of monitoring you're doing of the network as a whole, each of the blockchains as well as each of the customer's accounts. Um, and the New York AG a couple of years ago did a study on some of the leading exchanges and actually highlighted some of the key risks that, that she felt was not being adequately addressed. There has been significant movement in the last couple of years, I think, on that front. Um, so let, let me just leave it yeah. there. But. And, and you raised an interesting point about you know, decision rights of the custodian and what they take on and what right. they don't. There's also instances where it may not be up to you, right? There's stuff that just comes at you, right? We've had we've had forks, we've had we continue to have airdrops and different in different types. You have shit coins flying around every once in a while coming at you. I don't know what that is? <laughs> forget, figure out, figure that out before you make a call. Um, but and, and interestingly, so the IRS, uh, we got some guidance, air quotes guidance, a few weeks ago about you know what happens. And there is a in the case of an airdrop or a fork. And there is a difference if you hold your digital assets under your own control versus through a custodian. So what it does, it even highlights the importance of having somebody in control to, and, and you're looking out for, on a lot of different levels, right? You're protecting yourself against mm -hmm. new stuff flying around, and also protecting your customer base who has rights, probably, to an asset which they should have, and then how that translates to our guidance, because it's, you know, this concept of dominion and control is a real thing, but it's different in the hand, if your digital assets are held with a custodian than, than outright. This, I mean, you're really under a lot of pressure yeah, here to it's, deliver, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the whole um, 
complexity of forks and airdrops and just uh, for, for those in the room who may not be familiar with those terms, forks are kind of a, um, a case where a blockchain is kind of functional and then um, uh, something they decide to take something in a different direction and they end up with a, a net new asset. Uh, and the, the net new asset kind of gets delivered uh, by virtue of the existing keys that control uh, that asset. Um, and so if you are in the position of being custodian, uh, you've got uh, a key that controls an asset, and all of a sudden that key controls another asset. Uh, and from our point of view, uh, we want all our um, institutional clients, anybody who's kind of using our platform, uh, to be able to uh, benefit from that, the fact that a new asset came in, uh, there, was, there was a fork, while at the same time making sure that any, any new asset that comes in, something that will run through our asset framework, make sure that it's safe to hold, make sure that it is uh, something that you actually do want to participate in. Uh, and going to the point about hardware security modules, HSMs, uh, we think that this is the, absolutely the, the right way to store crypto assets. Um, HSMs, for, for those who don't know, they're these devices called hardware security modules. Um, I'm going to make them sound like they're really neat and uh, really kind of a cool thing, but in reality, they're actually quite boring. Uh, they've been around since the, the late 80s, early 90s uh, as a, a device that was used by military and uh, very large fintechs uh, in order to secure their infrastructure. Uh, and so it is this absolutely mature technology uh, that really needs to be used within cryptocurrency right now. It is, uh, there's, these are purpose-built devices for secure storage of keys. Uh, and so we as a custodian think that that is absolutely the, the right way to do it. And one of the things that using HSMs allows us to do is uh, very easily be able to implement uh, support for forks and support for airdrops uh, because we're able to keep, keep the keys flexibly and be able to, uh, as Rob is talking about, uh, take that um, custodial obligation very seriously in that we can say, hey, look, you've gotten a new asset. We're gonna do all we can to make sure that you can hold this safely um, and work with you to allow you to claim that fork and start to represent it on your books, uh, represent it on your balance sheet, um, maybe maybe sell it if you, uh, if you want to exit that position. Whatever the case may be, uh, we are there to support our clients. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting in that the points of view of custodians are, are not all equal about you know, what to accept, when to accept it, which then impacts the, the, the owner of the digital assets from a tax perspective, right? Some debate, interesting how some of the, what came out in the guidance could be contrary to some traditional IRS guidance, but nonetheless, this is the directional thinking today. Highly complex topic, right? A lot on you. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, as we look out for you know, the rest of the ecosystem, how this fits into how this fits into that as well, right? I mean, what do you do if you know, you, you've got your assets somewhere you, you're sort of at odds? Right? How does this fit into a, a broader control framework and yeah. who you choose? I mean, you know, as we think about it from an enterprise perspective, this whole notion of that there are good risks and bad risks. A good risk is the actual exposure or the utility of what it is that you've created. The bad risk is a risk you don't need to take. It's not gonna have any upside for you. Like if you wanted to, like holding your own crypto, if it's not a core competency, it's probably a bad risk. That's probably something you want to mitigate. Go to someone that actually has that as a core competency. But in the enterprise space, and this can be a little confusing when it comes to certifications and say, well, how do I determine a good custodian or an exchange from a bad one? There is a certain set of mechanisms in the enterprise space about how assurance gets communicated in a B2B model. And this is not a, you know, apparent to everyone, but people that have been in the space understand it. So there are certain types of reports that auditors use to communicate assurance to auditors of other enterprises. And it's called SOC, it's a Service Organization Control Framework, it's an AICPA reporting mechanism. But, but these SOC reports, be it a SOC 1, which is an auditor to audit communication to support the, their production of the financial statements, or a SOC 2, which is more a management communication vehicle. There are established frameworks for how companies are to use auditors to actually communicate assurance that their risks have been mitigated. Um, because if you're a business and you're in the crypto space, even though it's a great idea to go use a custodian, you're still ultimately responsible for a lot of the risks as, as an enterprise, right? You don't, uh, you're not able to step away and say that that's someone else's risk to manage. You still got to do the evaluation, the due diligence to know that uh, there's risks are being actively managed. And the way that you do that, the reasonable approach to that would be the receipt of a SOC report from a reputable firm that shows how those risks are being mitigated. So this is why I suspect in this space you will see a lot more SOC 
reporting as a vehicle to communicate assurance from exchanges, custodians, to the enterprises that sit on top that are relying on those services. Yeah, maybe uh, Tim to, to step onto this conversation here. You know, we've been talking to a lot of clients who are within their own enterprise creating a digital asset business that they're doing. We're talking to clients, you know, thinking about the overall ecosystem of how do I rely on a custodian. Beyond just the SOC report, you know, one thing you really got to do and what we're doing with a lot of people who are thinking about this is really thinking through the whole structure. You really got to map out who owns what responsibilities, you know, what are the initial, who we're going to do business with, what's the, go through all the risks and assertions of who owns things, what ultimately impacts my financial statements, and you really got to think about where do those responsibilities reside. You know, is it in my own organizations like Tim was talking about? Is that the responsibility of the custodian? Really got to make sure you're spending time with the custodian to understand what their controls are. Um, the soccer port's one way to do it. Going to the custodian is another way to do it. But um, you know, us as auditors, we're going through that same thing right now as we think through this. Really making sure we got all those risks mapped and that we understand everything's covered off. Um, and not, there's not one size fits all for any company or any you know any digital asset. And so it takes a lot of time to maneuver through this. And so really, again, it comes back to getting the right people in the room to think through these things. Mm -hmm. what, what's changed a lot, right? We've been, we've been this for a while. What, what, are, what are some of the significant changes you've seen, Michael, over the last, you know, five or six years we've been, we've been sort of talking about this? How are you helping people? I, I think it's just the formality around it. And, you know, really, you know, looking forward to um, as enterprises, public companies started to get, start to get engaged in this space, yep. um, it brings, uh, it's good to see that a lot of the formality is coming into play um, because like Tim and Brian said, there's gonna be requirements around Sarbanes-Oxley controls, which is a management assertion over the controls at a public company. And if they're pointing to a custodian, they're gonna to need to make sure that as a public company and management of a public company that that, that those uh, rails are in place and they understand where the risks reside. So seeing a little bit of for more formality come into play is really important to get the enterprises coming in. And that's when you really see an acceleration of an industry when you have the real institutional dollars coming into play. Mm -hmm. Different kind of stakeholder evolving these days. You seeing more like heavy enterprise come in with a different lens. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a, a number of number of trends that we've seen. But probably the biggest one would be uh, the net new types of clients that are coming in, uh, but also just the uh, increasing regulatory clarity. So can talk about can talk about kind of both. Uh, we serve kind of uh, institutional investors, enterprises, people who are looking to hold significant amount of assets, and what we've seen is. Um, there's a, a set of early adopters uh, kind of over the last few years who were kind of forward-leaning crypto funds that were looking to get in. Uh, but now we're seeing um, very, very traditional organizations start to look at the asset class and say, hey, we would like some, some amount of exposure to crypto assets. Um, a, a big trend that we've seen is family offices. Um, and family offices uh, want to invest in crypto, maybe allocate one, two percent of their portfolio into crypto. And what we're seeing is a lot of them um, are looking for both kind of the uh, audit assertions, kind of a, your, your SOC assertions or things like that, but they also actually look at doing site visits. So they've actually come to our office, kind of meet us, uh, see that we're kind of a real organization. So they're really, really focused on doing their uh, due diligence. Um, seeing um, some of the more traditional endowments start to get into taking positions into, into crypto. Uh, and if you're, if you're uh, kind of an organization like that, you tend to be more on the conservative side and want to have a lot of the, a lot of the sign offs, a lot of the comfort that you can get from knowing, hey, my, my custodian, there is a, say a big four auditor that has signed off on their control environment. Uh, and feels confident that they have organizational discipline that is needed, uh, they're accurate in all of their accounting, uh, and they're doing a good job with the technology because the, the technology risk here is kind of a, a net new risk that a lot of traditional assets haven't had. Uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the assets themselves and what we're seeing there, there's just kind of an explosion and prol proliferation of different kinds of things. I mean, we've talked about Bitcoin is where everything began, but uh, different kinds of stable coins, starting to see uh, tokenization of non-digital assets, say gold or diamonds come to mind. Uh, so just a, a, a lot of interesting stuff that's starting to happen. And the fact that you can, um, say, tokenize a traditional asset um, might make it easier to trade, easier to kind of create a ready market in that area. Um, those are all kind of interesting trends that um, all of it kind of builds up from the fact that there are now 
um, institutional custodians that are available and are able to kind of enable this next set of uh, business lines and uh, market infrastructures. I mean, you, you mentioned accounting as one thing. I mean, this is yeah. it's been rather gray for a long time. Are you are we starting to see now points of view that even even if there aren't formal rules, are we seeing I call them norms maybe evolve over time? Like people are getting more comfortable. This is the case if there's not something directly on point. Are we feeling better about that? Um, for for the base cases, I think around accounting, we have some guidelines, but uh, once you start getting into altcoins and new types of uh, digital assets that are coming out, yep. when we look at it, it's everything's a unique case. It's um, yep. you, you really do have to think through the rights and obligations associated with the token, um, you know, what the consensus mechanism is, really think through the details to be able to get to an accounting answer because there's no on-point accounting guidance. You can use the existing guidance to get you to an answer in all cases, um, but sometimes it's not as intuitive as you think it yep. might be. But, and we're in exactly the same place for tax, right? It's like you've plenty of people saying, oh, the guidance is out there, just make analogies to 80-year-old case law. <laughs> like this is, this is not helpful entirely. But, but this is where we're at, and, and, you, and you develop norms over time. Mm -hmm. but, but to your point, everything is, is, is unique, right? Every, every little fact matters. When you have somebody who issues a security token, is it really equity, right? When you issue equity, that is the norm there is a tax-free transaction, but you have to, you have to ask yourself the question, is it equity? Because if it's not, right, you've just issued this thing, that becomes a taxable transaction. That just means that that thing you've just issued, you just burned 30% probably in tax, which is a very different construct, which is why when people throw around the term, you know, security token that fixes everything. Well, maybe a little, okay, <laughs> we can talk about it. But, you know, little facts make a, make a big difference. Um, you know, the, the digital representation of physical goods now, gold and diamonds being a, a great example, you know, so you have something that is then a physical asset custodied somewhere, and then you have ownership moving between jurisdictions, that's a real thing, particularly like fractionalized real estate, mm -hmm. right? All of a sudden you have like cross-border ownership and transfer of real estate that you're just like, oh, it's just a token, I just moved to my buddy in this other country. That's like a really big deal. And so just understanding about what we have and then the obligations to custodians to make sure that you're reporting these things correctly because informational reporting is a big deal, particularly in cross-border transactions, right? We have it um, throughout you know, the audit spheres of, of the world and controls. So a lot of interesting topics. One of the big trends that, that I'm seeing come around, and we've talked about Nathan, is staking, right? People are not just holding their assets in a place saying, okay, well, that's a store of value, I'm gonna keep it there and it's safe. They're putting them to work, mm -hmm. right? This is a massive shift in the way that we think about assets. You wanna talk about that just a little bit, what you're seeing and so what you're excited about? Yeah, so this one, um, uh, going back to kind of when, um, when Anchorage started a couple of years ago, our, our kind of core thesis was that um, crypto assets and their, their reputation, representation and their storage are inherently linked to the operation of the, of the crypto network. Um, and you see this um, in proof of stake probably most, uh, most tan tangibly, where the, literally the holders of a crypto asset have some amount of responsibility and financial incentive to help run the network itself. And that is only possible to do uh, if your assets are stored in a way that you can use them kind of on, a, on an ongoing basis uh, quickly, efficiently, and uh, reliably. Um, and that is kind of one of, the, one of the trends that we're seeing, that custodians are not just holding the assets, uh, but are really ending up taking this responsibility for uh, functionality of the network uh, via proof of stake. Um, and so the, the whole reason we kind of set up our infrastructure the way we did was to enable those kinds of use cases. Uh, and what ends up being interesting there is that uh, in many cases, um, deciding not to participate in staking has a dilutive effect on your holdings. Uh, and so you kind of have almost a fiduciary obligation. And it, it, I, I would actually pretty strongly say that you do have a fiduciary obligation to participate in these, um, in these protocols. Uh, because what's happening is more, more of the cryptocurrency is being issued uh, and then your proportional share might go down if you don't participate in that. Uh, and so investors are looking to custodians to help them provide that infrastructure uh, to allow them to uh, protect, their, protect themselves from dilution. Uh, but that's just kind of one of, the, one of the use cases that is being interesting in terms of active participation. We recently rolled out uh, a new product line within Anchorage called Anchorage Governance. Uh, where assets within our platform, you will be able to vote 
uh, in the network. Uh, and so the, the most significant asset here right now is this asset called Maker, uh, where the holders of Maker are able to vote uh, um, on various questions about the network. Uh, rather than having the developers so decide or the miners decide, as might happen in other assets, um, the, the holders of Maker are actually enabled and incentivized to uh, vote on the direction of where the asset will go. Uh, and so that's a, a, a growing area for custodians to focus on, which is like, how do I, how do I stake the assets to present, prevent dilution, but then how do I uh, get to actively participate and really help um, prove the hypothesis of the entire network? Um, so lots of, uh, lots of interesting um, capabilities there, and that's an area that we really think is going to expand over the next, um, over the next decade, really. Uh, we're going to see more and more complex crypto assets uh, with more and more interesting and uh, novel um, active participation use cases where the holders of the asset are not just kind of passive holders, but really have a responsibility to help the network function, operate, and, and decide on the, the direction. And then the cycle starts again, right? Now you have different types of staking mechanisms, different types of rewards, and then Indeed. you have to say, okay, when is the income? How much is the income? What are like how how are we sharing the revenue? Where does yes. it hit first? We talk about controls. We talk about accounting. It's like the whole cycle starts again, and they're all different, right? Yeah. All the mechanisms. The, I mean, the, the other area that still needs and actually has some interesting innovation, but it still needs further development is in this tension between privacy and transparency. So. Uh, the, there is a, a reasonable expectation and a necessity in some cases for privacy. Um, I mean, not the, the, the blockchains of the future are not going to be fully transparent. I mean, you start to see this in some of the enterprise blockchains that have got directional privacy, like a, a supply chain track and trace system where uh, you can see transparency of what's come to you, but you cannot see further up the chain. And, and this is how zero-knowledge proofs are being used. But you've got many examples with like some of the privacy coins that don't have acceptable transparency, auditability. And this is a problem for auditors, it's a problem for regulators. Um, so th there needs to be continued evolution. And there's a couple of coins that are working on trying to solve this where you can have acceptable privacy so that counterparties get to see what they need to see, but it also is sufficiently auditable and transparent for regulators, for KYC, suspicious activity reporting, all those mandates. So there's a number of bases that have to be checked, and we're not quite there yet as an industry, but you know, I suspect the next couple of years we'll, we'll see some solutions and start to address this. Awesome. So, so what, are we, what are we most excited about? What's, what, what's coming at us that you're saying? I, mean, I, I love all the new business models that are now possible. <laughs> Things like you know, IP rights management and being able to track the use of intangible property and you know, real-time rev splits and, and real-time accounting and auditing. And that, that's fascinating to me. It's, just, it, it's getting, it's getting you know, funds and rewards back in the hands of where it should have been rather than having to chase it back through paperwork and legalese. I mean, I love that concept of where things are going. Um, what, what else are you su super excited about? I know the regulatory environment clarity is always good. But what, <laughs> like what, what's the cool stuff you're seeing that just really gets you jazzed? Um, I, I think for me it's locking down the, uh, the security and the understanding of the infrastructure so that you can, actually, you can rely on it and you can kind of step away. Um, and that's really when a lot of the, uh, the developments are going to happen, the real interesting financial innovations. Um, once you lock down the infrastructure, you can trust that it's secure and reliable. You can really build and really create really re unique products. So, you know, working toward that and, you know, working with service providers, working with um, the industry to bring that forward so you can rely on the underlying and then build on top. Yeah. Well, it's true because we had we had so much innovation in the infrastructure. It was there, but it, it's, it, you feel like it's finally catching up and mm -hmm. that enables now another wave of innovation. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, all the apps you have on your phone, they only work because there's 4G. We're coming out with 5G. Yep. They work better once the infrastructure is there. So, um, you know, the cool stuff you can do, you just take for granted now. Yep. Which is clearly the trend, right? I mean, all yeah. the infrastructure models out there are getting all the attention, which is, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. This is good. Yeah, I'd say the big, big areas I'm focused on are, um, are kind of excited about are uh, increased institutional participation in digital assets uh, as kind of a, a forerunner to more uh, retail and consumer use cases. Uh, I think in a, in a lot of ways, um, just like just being able to rely on a stable infrastructure that you can use to build the, the next set of uh, use cases is a really, 
really kind of an exciting use case. And so being able to, as much as we can, uh, enable institutions, uh, which will therefore kind of lead to uh, additional retail adoption, things like the, uh, the more um, ambitious stablecoin projects that we're seeing come out. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, real opportunity to bring um, some of these advantages of cryptocurrency that we're, we're all kind of hoping for that we haven't yet seen realized. Uh, a lot of that ends up being very, very exciting. It, it's changed the level of conversation, mm -hmm. hasn't it? I mean, when yeah. you see a lot of the traditional financial institutions you know, talking about it in a very calm, methodical manner, it's just, it's, yeah. uh, it's a nice change. Right? Yeah. People don't look at us like we have a third eyeball as much anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> Not monsters. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I see it's almost inevitable, this personalization of ownership, right? So everything you own is going to be directly tied to you through biometrics. And so from your, your driving license, all your rights and obligations, everything that you own that's associated with you, including all your assets, are directly tied to you through biometrics. And, and the, the biometrics piece, getting away from passwords, is really critical because I don't know if any of you have followed the Turpin case, Turpin suing AT&T. He was the guy that lost $24 million through a SIM swapping situation where you know, it's text-based two-factor authentication and how easy it is to compromise that. And so when it comes to, again, sort of deciding on sort of what's that overall security protocol, sort of being aware of some of the risks. So two-factor authentication is good, but there are clearly problems if you're relying on a text-based only. It's so fun to be a part of those experiments, yeah. right? When you're checking it out. But, but eventually, yeah, this whole world is going to start to kind of get to accepted leading practices. Yep. And it's going to be something you're not even going to have to think about. You just are going to have direct access to everything that you own immediately and be able to sort of be nimble with where you place stakes and all these like, opportunities for social impact, participation, um, and things like that through you being able to say, I really believe in this. And, and governments really want this, right? There's these public-private partnerships yeah. where you, the government can put money in, you as an individual can put money in to say, this is important to this community and I'm gonna get behind it. Yeah, the social impact is yeah. good. Awesome, so before they get the hook, Brian, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll make it quick. I agree with everything Mike said in the audit world, but one yeah. thing I'm really excited about is all the different parties coming to the table to create guidance and solutions around all this. You know, you really see all these different players working together, regulators working together, standard setters working together, so that we can have frameworks around this, right? Yeah. So we're not always doing this one-off, one-off, one-off. You know, you just see a lot of collaboration going on to create solutions, and the transparency excites me around yeah. everybody working together to make this really work well. Good discussions, right? People are actually talking. That's right. Meaningful discussions, not just scowling, but having right. great conversations, <laughs> so this is good. I mean, great conversation. Thank you guys so much for, for doing this. Hopefully this was helpful. Yeah. Thank you all very much for being here.